Hey there, and welcome back to Screenplay Rewind, hosted by me, Ron, and Jeff. And this is part two of our coverage of Southbound. Just a quick reminder about spoilers. If you have not yet seen the film, we do go into spoilers right from the get-go. We did in part one as well, and that has not changed here. So, full spoiler warning. And other than that... Welcome back and enjoy the show. Okay, uh, so that brings us to the fourth segment of the movie. Uh, this segment is called Jailbreak, uh, directed by Patrick Horvath, written by Dallas Hallam and Patrick Horvath, the director. Um, a lot of instances where the directors were also included in the writing. Uh, yes, and I, think that's and like, I like love you mentioned that. Earlier. I do too. I think you really get a strong voice of the story when you have, uh, you know, control of it both before it gets to the screen and uh, after it's actually, you know, the process of being filmed. So um, this one, uh, as we had mentioned, because all the stories kind of inter- interconnect as they begin and end, uh, the voice over the phone, who is one of the EMS uh, kind of stand-ins talking to Lucas, leaves the phone booth and walks over to a bar called The Trap. Okay. When she walks in, This is my favorite Easter egg out of all the awesome Easter eggs in this movie that I don't know a lot of people have noticed because I didn't see this on IMDb or on Wikipedia as far as I saw. Okay. When she walks in to the bar, there is a poster advertising a band that was supposed to be playing at this bar. Is it uh, uh, the white tights? The tight whites? There is a poster in the bar saying the white tights playing tonight. Oh. So the gig they were going to with, uh, with Sadie and her band was to play at this bar. And it, that's in the town where awesome. Sadie just died in the hospital. Yes. Because someone rung out her lawn after hitting her. With the car. <laughs> wow. Like an awesome yeah. So the next time you watch it, pay attention as she's walking in the bar, you will see uh, playing tonight, the white tights at the trap. They have a poster inside the bar. That, uh, the white tights at the trap sounds like a legit gig at a legit place. Does that not sound like something you would hear on like on the radio? Yeah, yeah. Being advertised, the white tights at the trap. At the trap, yeah. Yeah. I was uh, in my notes referring it to as the referring to it as the bar with no name. Because <laughs> I didn't know. Also, uh, can we can we go make can we go actually go like open up a bar called the bar with no name? Because that's an awesome name for a bar. I that know. I want to- that I want to have be a thing now. I don't know though that it's gonna uh, get the right clientele <laughs> based on what I know of the Marvel universe. <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> like... So yeah, uh, watch out for that Easter egg when you next watch the movie because it's fucking awesome. That's pretty good. And I, li- That's pretty and I good. love them for having that detail. That, that is an don't... MCU deep cut. Like that yeah. is that is something that I would expect from them. It's fucking awesome. Love love this movie. So. um we're looking inside the bar as the BMS uh, person over the phone uh, is, is walking in. She sits down inside the bar, and this is where you have the instance where they start, for whatever reason, making it like a, and you find out later why they're talking about how you didn't close the door. Yeah. And while this segment of the movie isn't as interesting as some of the other ones, it's not bad. I think Ron and I are both in agreement. It's, it's not bad. It's just not as strong as some of the other entries in it. Yeah, it's definitely my least favorite. It's it is, it is it doesn't make it bad, like you said, but it's not nearly as strong as the other four. Uh, but this is one of the cooler elements of this, uh, this, this uh, latching of the door that they're talking about that comes into play a little bit later. Uh, she is talking about how, you know, oh, it's it's locked. And then the, the bartender is like, no, it's it's not locked. And then they, they start having an argument about it. And at this point, a guy busts him with a shotgun. And at first, you think he's holding up the place. But he's like, no, this is not a robbery. Yeah. Uh, so this story is kind of... it's it, it, it works within the themes of the the movie sort of but it doesn't really play into the themes as much and i think that's why it suffers a little bit because this for the most part is not about someone coming to grips with their own guilt and i think that that makes it suffer yes uh it it's kind of a weird one it kind of infers that this is like a physical place you can go to and get get Uh, stuck in 
because this this guy who has busted in, his name's Danny. He is uh, on yeah, all he's talking about is how he's trying to find his sister. Or is he there over the guilt of not being able to find his sister, and he's reliving that? See, Fuck I this I movie, think, <laughs> like, dude. Yeah, yeah. Every everything <laughs> has like twelve different permutations on what could that should be happening. My read on this part of the story, though, is mm-hmm. that this uh, this segment jailbreak has nothing to do with Danny and his own personal guilt. I, 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 I think can see that. I think it's all about his sister and his sister's lack of guilt and accepting the place as a home. And that part's kind of cool. Like it adds a little bit more flavor to the place, but God, but because his it's sister. not his, <laughs> like, huh? I'm sorry. Said, but God, his sister, Jesus. Yeah. His sister's piece of work. Uh, it, it adds a lot of flavor to the, to the place itself, like the little town they're in, but it, it's, it's not as personal of a story. And I think that's why it suffers, but it still has some cool elements. One of the cool elements is there's just like straight up fucking like demons here. And that's kind of cool. Like, yeah, see, I was going to ask you, I was like, the fuck is going on? Because at first I was like, are we getting a werewolf story? What is happening? Yeah. You see the dude with his like fucking like giant like claws and you're just like, what the fuck's happening? Yeah. And and it's like all of a sudden, you know, we're in the bar that the Black Goat Motorcycle Club frequents. (laughs) (laughs) It's like, what is happening? It, it, it's, it goes a little like fucking like out of left field because it, it uh, I got uh, from dusk till dawn vibes from this segment, yeah. uh, it, it, which is a very well, which may be what they were going for with this one. Maybe they thought that's why this one would be the winner. I don't know. It's, a, it's, it's like a, it's a strong one eighty from the. the it theme. goes from like lo- yeah, it goes from like very Lovecraft to you know from dusk till dawn instantly. Which is it, it, it's kind of cool, but it's also a little bit out of left field. Yeah, and this one's also missing a lot it, of the like mystique and mystery and and, and all that. Yeah, that the but others yeah. Have. Um. So the dude with the uh, so the dude with the claws claws at Danny, who has a shotgun on the back, really bad, and he's injured. Uh. But he turns around uh and shoots him a couple times, blows off his hand, and uh, it's kind of interesting too. Are they insinuating that this is like a culmination of the black ichor? Because the blood that comes out of him looks like the black ichor. It looks a lot like that black ichor. I do have so a like line, I wa- though, of I can't kill you, but I'm sure that hurts like hell. Yeah, Danny's kind of a <laughs> badass. I like Danny. <laughs> Which also uh, infers that he knows exactly what they are. Yeah. Like he Danny knows the wor- about this place. I've got yeah, questions Dan- about Danny. <laughs> yeah, D- Danny knows seems to know what they are seems to be aware that this is kind of like an ethereal place yeah that that, that you know that, that doesn't really exist yet here it is and yeah it's it's very strange like i think they were trying to maybe just add a little bit more mystique overall to the the town instead of like just the concept of purgatory but i don't know he uh is, uh, is escorted by the bartender over to a uh kind of like a little hole in the wall like literally <laughs> <laughs> tattoo tattoo parlor and this is the same one that i actually like really like fuck from the... danny you just don't know it yet <laughs> i when love he... the bartender by the way yeah the bartender is pretty great um he uh walks up behind this like little like tasty freeze looking place like this ice cream <laughs> shop and that name's always gotten me and i don't know why <laughs> He walks up to uh, a part of a wall and tells Danny his sister's in here. And Danny's like, what the fuck? It's just, you know, it's just a fucking door. Uh, the bartender has these sigils in the back of his hand. And one of them is in the shape of an eye. And he places his hand up over his eye. And he fucking blinks and the tattoo blinks, which is pretty cool. Like, That's a this, really this, cool effect. This segment has like little bitty details I really like. It's just overall, it's not as strong. But like that, it's really cool. So when he has his hand held up over his face... Uh, he can he kind of see through the tattoo and it kind of like pierces the veil. Yeah. He can see things that, that everyone around him can't see. Like Danny has these two like weird looking like ghost silhouettes around him that he can't see that no one else seems to be able to see that are there, but they're there when he looks through his And they're his like tattoo. turning towards him and looking at him. Mm-hmm. Is this um, at the back of the uh, the back of the, like the Burger King or wherever? This is like literally the back part of the ice cream shop. Okay. Uh, so he turns around with his uh, with his like new ability to see. He can see a door inside the wall that Danny can't see. Uh, he opens it, and this 
weird like little tattoo parlor is there and this is the callback to where they were making a, a strong point about the lady not closing the door to the bar her mm-hmm. not latching the door stops it from being uh uh like a, an actual door that danny can uh like enter so if she had just properly latched the door back it would have been this tattoo type room where you can't actually enter and her not closing the door and latching it properly actually lets danny into their purgatory right which which is again cool like love this um so he goes in the tattoo parlor uh he finds his sister his sister seemingly hasn't aged but danny she she makes a note about how danny has uh he says he's been looking for her for 13 years and she's ostensibly just been in this purgatory the entire time she doesn't want to leave she's telling danny you know you need you need to you know get the fuck out of here you don't belong here yeah you shouldn't be here um the bartender uh while danny's distracted kind of makes a little like a uh, attack at him it hits him in the back of the the leg danny shoots him in the chest and then uh kills him by or i, I guess kills him you know they're fucking demons you don't really yeah. know he uh shoots him in the head with a shotgun though Metal. So he grabs his he grabs his sister kind of against her will uh you know picks her up takes her out to his his car uh and he is now leaving the the purgatory uh area uh tries to you know get back onto the highway and they end up at this kind of like literal end of the highway. Yes. Where it kind of is converting from highway into just like straight up gravel, which based on what happens in their dialogue is, I guess, kind of like the end of the plane between the purgatory and actual existence. Is that kind of like what you got from it? I kind of got that, but I also kind of got like this, this area has like a mind or life of its own. Like, okay. The people like, okay. Lucas is probably just driving down an endless highway that loops. And like, nobody else has encountered this kind of thing before. And here the road literally just runs out. And they've already specified before this, that you could, can't, you should not leave the road. Do not leave the road. And here the road runs out. Mm. And, I don't know. It's, yeah, it's weird because yeah, the, the, the bartender says at one point, it looks like a desert, but you might not come back. Yeah, you don't want to go out there. You might not come back. And it just feels like this place is kind of like defending itself a little bit by making the road disappear where he has to drive out there if he's going to keep going. Specifically because he is the one person in the entire movie who has not been personally invited and needs to... Cause like, uh, his sister has accepted her responsibility for her actions in in, uh, uh, in the murder of uh, their parents, you find out. Mm-hmm. So she has kind of accepted her responsibility and is, is, has kind of accepted their purgatory as her own home. Uh, all the other characters are either reliving uh, their own purgatory or like Sadie's instance uh, in the accident as kind of like merged over into someone else's purgatory everyone else is there for a reason except for danny danny has not been invited danny somehow accidentally stumbled his way into the into the area yes so i yeah i think you're right i think it is a little bit of like it has a mind of its own and it's kind of like attacking him like an infection almost yes basically and then we get into some weird stuff here that i need to ask you about (laughs) i don't know what's happening I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he so he drives out <laughs> onto the the onto the just more pure desert stretch after he leaves the the ending of the highway and like is like it sounds like the car is about to literally fall apart. Like, it this feels a lot to me like like don't look back. Like what's what's the story in a uh, great mythology about the guy that goes into hell to get his girlfriend back and he actually plays music so sad it makes uh hades weep and he's like okay you can leave here with her but you have to trust that she's behind you and you can't turn around and look back otherwise i take Mm -hmm. her back and like he gets like two steps away from the end and turns around and looks back and then she gets whipped back into hell um that's what this feels like to me because it, it feels like He's doing it. Like, shit is happening. It seems like he might actually be leaving. It seems like he's kind of, like you mentioned, piercing the veil. It seems like he's literally ramming his car through the veil and leaving and loses his nerve and slams on the brakes. And she's yelling at him, do not stop. Um, God damn it. Hold on. 
that scared the shit out of me. All of a sudden, I heard a voice behind me. Siri just started talking to me out of nowhere. <laughs> um, so it seems like that he's about to do it and loses his nerve and stops. And she's just kind of like, God damn it, Danny. Like, you stopped. Well, but, you I, know, and I get the feeling like if he had just kept going, like he was almost there, like he was almost home free. Uh, yeah, and and unfortunately, you know, shit's at the fan, and they're in a bad way when uh, she literally tells them, like, oh, you know, like, where's the gun? You might have to, you know, shoot us both. And you're yeah. just like, Jesus. So they, they have uh, a, a last conversation here about how uh, they go into detail and reveal that what happened was that his sister has killed their parents we don't really know like the full details about why, but the brother, uh, Danny, the brother, he doesn't really blame her for it. So you wonder if maybe there was like physical abuse or something from the parents and, you know, she was just defending them. You don't know. It's, it's completely up to interpretation. All that, you know, for sure is that she killed their parents. Danny's been looking for her for a really long time. Somehow knows she was in this purgatory state in this area that he could finally 13 years later, find access to. However, she doesn't want to leave. She has accepted the responsibility and her I belong here is what she says. Her, yeah. This is why my interpretation of the accident is, uh, that he blew, he fails the test by leaving to me. You accept, uh, the purgatory and they stop their loops when you finally accept it and you stay there. It seems like they want you to stay with it, uh, with Mitch in the hotel room with the hospital that was locked for, uh, you know, uh, it seems like uh, with the accident, he was supposed to stay in the hospital. Maybe Sadie was supposed to just accept it and stay with the, the weird ass cult, you know? I don't yeah. know. Um, but I, I, I want to clear up real quick. I, I Googled it. It's um, Orpheus and Eurydice. That's the, uh, the Greek mythology. Uh, Eurydice is his wife. She is, uh, okay. she's in Hades. And Orpheus travels there and bargains with Hades to get her back. And he plays a song so sad it makes Hades cry, which is an experience he has not felt ever. And allows her to uh, to return with him, provided he assumes that she is behind him. And he makes it like two steps out and can't take it anymore. And looks behind him and loses. Mm -hmm. So he did all of it for nothing. He literally went to hell and came back. And came back empty-handed because he couldn't yeah. take it anymore. That's what this story kind of reminds me yeah, of. Yeah, there's a lot of parallels there where it, it, it doesn't feel like an accident. It feels like it was influenced by it for sure. Uh, um, I but, just wanted uh, to throw that out there since I didn't, I couldn't remember exactly which story it was. For sure. Um, so uh, Danny, at this point, uh, is ripped out of the car by the ghostly figures that the bartender was able to see through his tattoo uh, that no one else could see uh, earlier on that were there and kind of it's, it's weird. I almost wonder if they're kind of like how I mentioned how the purgatory area was kind of seeing Danny as an infection. Like these are like the, the white blood cells, like the bodyguards of the area they like attacking are him because he, <laughs> Because he doesn't belong there. That's kind of like my interpretation of it. I don't know if you feel the same way. Yeah, I don't. I didn't know what to make of them. They don't really seem to be doing anything. They're just kind of holding him. It's great, but it's also creepy because it's creepy. But he is acting like you see in a zombie movie where the zombie horde pulls the person out of sight, and that like it's obvious what's happening that they're being like torn apart. He's acting like that, and everybody else is just standing there. <laughs> I, I don't know, dude. I'd be pretty freaked out if, like, three big, fat, white, naked dudes, like, ripped me out of a car in the middle of the desert. Like, I'd be I'd be kind of freaking out. Like, I, I don't know. I don't know. I just couldn't figure out what was going on. It was just weird to me. It was weirdly edited. I think they could have edited it better. Like, they should have ripped him out of the car. Have you see that it's the, the weird, white, ghostly dudes? Mm -hmm. and then never show him again all you do is hear him screaming like, that, would have been a uh, like that moment in pitch black when she gets ripped away into the darkness yes like you should not like it, it, you know what they reminded me of have you ever played what? zombie mode on call of duty uh, black ops 2 there's a mode called transit and around i think i have played this it's where you ride the game. bus from area to area and 
in between each area is just this fog that you can't really see through. And if you go out in the fog, there's these little demon assholes that jump on your back and just start like clawing at you. <laughs> and you can't really get them off. They just jump on your shoulders and just start clawing at your face. And that's kind of what these guys remind me of, just because they're in an area you're not supposed to be in. And as soon as you go out there, they fucking show up and you can't really get rid of them. And that's kind of where my brain yeah. went when I saw this. Like, should have stayed on the bus, bro. Should have stayed on the bus, bro. Words to live by. That's our new tagline for the podcast. Should have stayed on the bus, bro. Should have stayed on the bus. Should have stayed in purgatory, bro. <laughs> so uh the sister just doesn't give a flying fuck that her brother is being like hugged to death out in the desert and she just turns around and drives back into the purgatory you know just and all of this after just flatly saying yeah i killed our parents i don't give a shit what yeah like it's just like what is happening it's really weird yeah every i don't know everything I, about this was just kind of out of place to me what but like if this had been a segment in any other horror anthology, it would have gone over better. The problem is that this is like, it stands out not because it's bad, but because it's bad by comparison to these other really it's a great B plus and everything else is an A plus. And it's also following the accident, which is like the best part of the movie. Yeah. So it makes, I think, I don't think it's as bad as it seems. It's bad by comparison. It's bad by comparison. And it's, it's made more so, by having to follow up the accident, which is the, the best part of the movie. I and think the it's because at this point, yeah, at this point, the movie has trained me to like think about what is going on, and that layer is missing from this one. Yeah, so it it, is, it, cool, just, it just comes across as hollow. It has some like cool elements to it. Um, it's just the overall theme is is missing. I I totally agree. Um, I I don't hate it. It it doesn't like take me out of the movie like i'm don't still enjoying it. don't at me <laughs> yeah yeah it's like the rest of the segments are like dark souls one and this is dark souls three it's fine it's just <laughs> it's fine oh uh, but, that's a pretty apt comparison actually yeah yeah <laughs> so she drives back into uh the town and this is when we switch back to our uh final story uh this is the way in uh, again, directed by the Radio Silence guys. This is another flawless transition because she walks, <clears throat> she walks past the Steak and Shake or whatever it is, the Dairy Queen, <laughs> and she walks past it. And one of our new protagonists is like watching her for whatever reason. It was a little odd, but you know she gets properly called out on it by Jesse, who just is like, "The fuck are you looking at?" And that makes our new protagonist kind of turn around and leave. And, you know, she, we know she's going back into the tattoo parlor, the literal hole in the wall tattoo mm -hmm. parlor, while our new girl here, Jim, I believe. Yes, that's, a, yeah, that's correct. It goes back to uh, join her family. And at first, Jeff, did you think that this girl was mute? No, but I don't blame you for thinking <laughs> that. She is We're like halfway here. through this story before she speaks. Uh, yeah, now that you mention it, it, it is like... <laughs> She's just kind of like, I mean, now, now to be fair, we've all been on those family getaways where we don't want to speak because we're stuck in a uh, fucking random spot. Mom and especially parents. dad are dorks. They look like they they plucked them from a fucking Dockers commercial. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, they're sitting out, out out of the front of the Tasty Freeze area. I like how we have like steak and shake and Tasty Freeze <laughs> instead of like whatever the fuck it was actually called. Oh, it was called. Oh, it, the name of it was actually really cool. It's a funny little um, joke for in joke for hell. It's called freezing over, like hell oh, freezing over. Nice. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I just remember that. Like that right there. The creamery that, with no name. That, <laughs> the, the detail of the fucking <laughs> ice cream shop being called freezing over and being an in joke to hell is why jailbreak stands out as being bad because it's it, the, the, like. It doesn't seem to have the attention detail. Like, it doesn't have yeah, like, any of that depth. Yeah. It's very, uh, very like superfluous compared to everything else. So uh, we gather from the conversations with this family, with the, the mom and dad and the, the kind of uh, uh, like 19 ish age daughter who's about to be going off to college. That this is kind of like their last family get together before she leaves to go to school. And uh, they leave the tasty freeze to, to go to the, to, to the motel which you will start if you're paying attention, you start to realize is the motel from the way uh, out from the beginning yes. of the movie. 
so the family is there they're uh just kind of you know they're uh, bringing, getting glasses of wine out uh you know there's kind of like chilling in the motel when they start to realize there's a siege on their motel and and three people are trying to break in um yeah i thought it was a motel and then i started thinking is it a motel or is it like one of those houses that you can rent because it's it's fucking roomy inside it's got a full kitchen it's got multiple bedrooms yeah but the place I, is kind of th- crazy it uh i think it is uh, a motel just because they had showed that same room with the the maid earlier and they left uh left uh, of the frame you know to show sadie's and her friend's room mm-hmm. so it seems it seems to be a motel it's just like a really robust motel for you know the maid I, I, I like my motels to be robust <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you're gonna be in fucking Burger King and hell, you might as well have a robust motel, you know, five stars. Um, but yes, uh, this should look somewhat familiar, also, right? Yes, the, the inside uh, you, layout of this place, the, the the inside layout you have seen at the uh, with with the Mitch scenes in the motel. You, if you're paying attention, it looks different because it's in, at nighttime instead of you know being in the middle of the day when they they showed it earlier in Mitch's segments for the most part, but. Yeah, and then when so, mom uh, when mom calls nine one one, our address should be a standout. Also, yes. Uh, so as as they're you know getting ready to kind of like you know brace for the siege of their motel room as people are about to break in, I did I did make a note of the the voice on the radio at this point. Okay. So at the beginning of this uh, of the scene when they're about to be breaking in, the voice on the radio, the DJ, he says, "Go ahead, make some mistakes. You can always get it right the next time." Yes. So this quote right here is kind of like making it clear if you're paying attention that they're making active choices every time they do loops of the purgatory scenes. It's not something it's not a one and done. They they do have choices they can make. And the main characters from the beginning of the movie, you'll soon learn, you know, make the wrong mistakes all over again. What are their uh, masks supposed to be? I don't know. I, one of them is clearly Sully from Uncharted, right? The one Mitch the is wearing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it just needs the cigar. Yeah. Right? It's pretty uh, great. That was close enough that I literally wrote that down. Um, <laughs> Sully stash. But yeah, the, uh, the other thing that I like, by the way, before we leave the uh, radio DJ, um, he plays also at the freezing over. And, um, well, we all know that the past can be a piece of shit sometimes, but when it catches up to you, you better be ready. Keep your eyes on the road and let that engine roar so loud that you can't hear those demons screaming in your ear. Lock the doors, make those tires burn, tell your family you love them, and kiss the past goodbye once and for all, because every road has got to end somewhere, am I right? And it's just like all of that is an allusion to what's about to go down. Yeah, they fucking just straight up tell you what's about to happen every time. Yeah. But the first time I watched the movie, for somehow it went over my head. I didn't pick up on all of it, like uh like the specificity of it. Uh, like like you said, like you know, like he's literally saying they're about to break into the fucking motel. Yep. Like what? lock your doors, your past is gonna catch up with you. Like it's all there. Yeah, it's all there. Okay, uh, I so think of, the- I think out of everything that happens, by the way, the reason this is happening to this dude, I think, is probably the most obvious. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the three guys in mask are attacking the motel. They they uh, they're able to break in, make their way inside. Uh, is is it at this point to where? Yeah. Uh, so they have the the the, the mom and dad uh, in like a different room, kind of uh, trapped. Yes, the family uh, got Jim, separated. Yeah, the family got separated. Jim is able to hide in a different area of the motel. Uh, Hello, once, pop it. <laughs> once, <laughs> once they have the mom and dad, it's clear that's all they're really there for because they no longer care about where the daughter is. All they want is the the uh, the mom and the dad, at, at least one of the two. Well, there's kind of a reason for that too, right? Yeah. So uh, at this point, the guys in the masks they have the mom and dad trapped in kind of like the living room area of the motel. Uh, the mom and the dad are just uh, are at first kind of like, what the fuck's going on? The mom's freaking out until the dad starts to recognize why this is happening. And the dad starts to comment on uh, 
something that's happened in the past that uh, he clearly, uh, you know, he he did some terrible thing in the past that has really pissed off these guys the best because he 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 recognizes them, recognizes them eventually. Yes. The one of the guys in a mask uh, leans down to the to the wife and whispers in her ear what exactly happened. We don't we don't hear exactly what happened. All we see is kind of her reaction to. Uh, she's like uh, I forget, I forget exactly what her quote is, but she's kind of like appalled at what she's been told. Yes. Um, and he basically confirms it even without knowing what it is. Yeah. Uh, they uh. In a, few, in a few scenes, we can go ahead and t- talk about how the, these are Mitch and Jack, the two main guys uh, in, in the beginning of the movie. They are having this. this and the third the guy that we know things can't end well for because we haven't met oh, him uh, yet. Yeah, he was not in the early part of the movie. <laughs> and there's some weird shit happening in Purgatory, funny but enough. So maybe that is a good way to throw you off, though. True. Because Mitch True. and Jack were just two dudes in a truck. And it's, True. you know, you're seeing the truck or, and a car outside, but... There's three dudes. It can't be Mitch and Jack. See, I, I still immediately knew this was Mitch and Jack. I, I just I didn't I have a clue. Won- oh, you didn't have a clue. I didn't have a clue. I, I, as soon as they showed up in, in masks, I knew. Big, I, I, my brain connected like the puzzle, the piece, the pieces of the puzzle. As far as like, they have masks. This has to tie back into the early part of the movie. Like, and I'm not used to anthologies being connected again, so I wasn't even really thinking that way. Even though I should have been by this point. True. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't know the details, but like something in my brain like connected the dots, and I, I knew Mitch and uh, Jack had to be involved in this in some way, and I, I and I uh, figured I wish I hadn't because it would have been a kind of a cool. So like, you actually had it presented as a twist then when they revealed who they were. Yes. Okay. And it so, was pretty good. <laughs> so this, so this was the uh, event that that kind of leads to them at the beginning of the movie that you're you're not informed of until just now. So. While they have uh so the so Mitch holds up a picture uh just before he reveals you know who he is and takes off uh his mask uh, of a little of a little girl who we you know have have now seen that it's his daughter uh you know when you're cross referencing the first segment with the last segment so like is is what you think uh what do you think happened with this like did the dad just kill the daughter and that's kind of what you're you're meant to be Drawing um, from this, based on his wife's reaction, I'm thinking uh, probably raped and murdered and dumped. That's yeah. Uh, that that was my at the least. Yeah, they don't tell you specifically what happened. You're mm-hmm. only meant uh, to kind of draw uh, inspiration by like what they say as far as like. And what, what I alluded happened. to earlier was when you know they basically tried to let Jim go. Is this guy is here for revenge on his daughter. And the picture, by the way, we should say is the girl from the beginning in the hotel room. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, that, that Mitch but, was always chasing after, but could never catch, but could never catch. And, um, yeah, this, this guy is here for him and he's here to avenge the death of his daughter. So he's letting this guy's daughter go. Like, this is too close to home. Just get out yes. of here. I have what I want. Um, so with with the uh, uh, what happens to the wife is interesting. Uh, they kill her by suffocating her with a t shirt, mm-hmm. ramming it down her throat. Uh, and Jack uh, kills her with a t shirt. So what's cool is like in the first segment, uh, segment, a little Easter egg is that when he's uh, cleaning up uh, all the blood off of him, he like picks his shirt up in the first segment up over his head, and that's when the creature drags the shirt against his face mirroring the suffocation that jack did to the, the wife and then his so, no- death when we talked about the very specific way he died was by uh-huh. having this sickle thing rammed down his throat the way this shirt was rammed down her throat yeah exactly so is- tying back into when i said we know exactly which creature this was because something's gonna happen later <laughs> and uh yeah moving on <laughs> so uh um so the uh the wife's been killed the the dad is uh he he says you know she's innocent she's innocent she's innocent so it the 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 crime they're avenging was purely from the dad's perspective it wasn't anything they had really against the mom they just kind of killed the mom as a as a kind of final fuck you to the dad essentially pretty much they wouldn't kill the daughter because like he said it was too close to home with his own daughter being you know 
presumably raped and murdered, but yeah. they, based they did on everybody kill the else's wife. reaction, it's either are you really letting a witness go or it was part of the plan to kill everyone. Either way, he has to let her go because he's here to avenge his own daughter. He's not gonna kill another daughter, especially since she is blonde, also. So the uh-huh. family is white, his daughter's white, she's blonde, his daughter's blonde. Like it's just too close. He can't yeah. he can't pursue her. Mm-hmm. Um, so a little bit of humanity, even if he is a shit. Mm -hmm. So he, uh, stabs the dad, uh, several times in in the, in the stomach with a knife to kill him. And they, uh, start to have kind of like little, like, uh, fights with the daughter because the, the the daughter, uh, you know, has an opportunity to to leave and you think she's left because she kind of has like a little like a uh, chance where she hits the third dude. That's not the two guys from the beginning, you know, in the head with the baseball bat after she set a little trap, you know, like putting the golf club on the, the, the horn in the car. Yeah. Jim is badass. <laughs> yeah. Jim's pretty badass. You know, so she's, she's like setting like fucking home alone traps for these assholes and shit. Like, yeah, she's trying. She's, it's just, she's too late by the time, you know, she eventually gets her way. Uh, she, she's able to get back into the house and see that her, you know, her mom and dad have been killed runs uh into like the kitchen area and like adding to her badassery after jack has like grabbed hold of her she starts fucking stabbing him with the corkscrew that was used to open up the wine bottle Dude, can you imagine I balled up into a little tiny ball oh. on the couch can you imagine the getting stabbed multiple effect, times by a ripping and tearing crew, sound dude. oh mm. my god doom guy would be so happy <laughs> it was so awful to listen to deserved I can, but so i can awful. only I, I need to i need to watch this movie again with headphones because I, I can't oh, imagine dude don't it's, do it. it's brutal <laughs> enough just in regular tv mode but uh she runs through the the house to kind of get away and she runs back into mitch who had a knife out and she accidentally stabs herself essentially by running into mitch yeah she impales herself on it essentially yeah. And, you know, this is the one time that Mitch, you know, he, 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 they legitimately did not want to kill the daughter. This was, this was something they're actually, you know. And this they, is they the reveal. Guilty. Right after that is when he pulls the mask off. I think they had already pulled the masks off by that point. Had they? I, uh, I could have swore I, it was I could here. Be, I could be I could wrong. Be, I could be mistaken. I think it was right after they show the picture of the, the daughter when they pull the mask off, but I could be mistaken. But uh, and he has and, the but, line of, what have we done? Yeah. Um. Now, <laughs> here the we take fucking, a turn, <laughs> the, the, dude. Like when you see out of the stab wound, the fucking tentacle leg of the bloodborne creature come out through her stomach and is replaced in in like just a full view of the bloodborne creature, but like a slightly different version of it. I was like, "Fuck, I love this movie." <laughs> yeah, here it turns into just a fucking straight up like horror monster movie. Yeah, yeah. Uh, all of the corpses are replaced by these bloodborne creatures. Yep. Uh, as they're about to be uh, heading out to their truck to get the fuck out of Dodge, the ground starts to like rip apart. Like there's goddamn graboids about to like pop out and eat them. Like that's pretty much what I was thinking. Uh, the ground starts to to dissipate uh, as they're grabbing the third dude who was with them to to take him out near the truck to leave. Fucking tentacles come up from the ground, wrapping them around, like in coils around him, and then like pull him into the fucking earth. Uh, no, in mine. This, <laughs> in this massive fucking blob of tentacles, dude. Uh, it's so terrifying. And then and then uh, Jack continues like, "What the fuck?" <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> the ongoing Jack series of yeah. what the fucks. Yeah. Uh, they, so they're just like, "Fuck that, dude." Uh, he's ripped away from the tentacles. They get in the truck and, uh, you know, they just barely were able to get the truck started to back away as the ground is still, you know, giving way. And, and they, they interestingly enough, one of the very few jump scares in this movie, probably the only one that I remember anyway, is yeah, uh, they hit one with their truck, you know, like, fuck you. And they like close their eyes and like, so they don't even know if it's going to work, slam into it. And, they think that, you know, they left it behind and then it comes up over the hood and I tries to come through the windshield. And yeah, it's like, this it's, is it's, where it's, you it's realize edited. that their face is fucking open and that there's a yes. skeleton inside. Yeah, because like the flaps of black skin like peel left and right and its skeleton face like sticks out and its bottom 
jaw does the thing I mentioned earlier about how it has like the predator, like how it like it's like a. It reminds me of like the Reapers split. from Blade Two. Yeah. Um. They uh. Yeah. You've seen the like human looking skeleton on the inside of it here and there from different camera angles, but you haven't seen it open before. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it here it's like in full on attack mode, which you have not seen these things do outside of ramming the scythe tentacle down the dude's right, which was obviously mom. <laughs> yeah. So so um give me Ghost enough, Rider any day. I don't want to face in- these things. Interesting enough, I, I don't uh think that it like symbolizing the death of the mom is like the the thing like taking revenge or anything. I think it's just like these these creatures are running their purgatory and like punishing you specifically with a reflection of your own guilt if they can. Like right. I, I, I don't I don't view that uh I don't view it sticking its uh tentacle like viciously down his throat as like an act of revenge as as if it was like, you know, that same creature. I just feel like they have like a hive mind and all they care about is making you experience yeah. a reflection of your own crimes. Like, yeah, I don't think it's actually mom. I think the body's like the gateway that they came through or something. It's it, it, it it's it's very interesting. I, I don't know if it's just to horrify the person that they're chasing or if that is the actual gateway that they come through. But this seems to be the catalyst for a lot of what has just happened in this movie. <laughs> true i don't um, I, I don't I, know i also think how uh so we mentioned about how like all the corpses with uh the mom and the dad turn into the bloodborne creatures i i also now retroactively think that the sadie's friends were these bloodborne creatures like they're able to since they were able to stand in as the other people in the simulation right in this instance i think they were playing the parts of like her friends and and so forth mm-hmm. so is this is this how they ended up in this purgatory situation? Is this how it starts? Or was this the purg- purgatory simulation the entire time? I think it's, I think everything we see is not the first loop from Mitch and Jack. I think we've seen them do it multiple times. Um, okay. Uh, that's just my interpretation. I, I don't think we see the beginning point. Um, I think, I think they've been doing this for a while and they just always have them like in a loop. Where they, I guess maybe at like the beginning of their loop, they are able to make them like forget. Yeah. Be- because um, it's also interesting too. Like they fucking killed Jack by, you know, uh, you know, having the Bloodborne creature kill him, but like they could just reset him again, you know? Yeah. Like, why not? You know, the, that's not even necessarily the end of his fucking loop. You know, they could have just thrown him right back into the situation with the family at the motel. You know, you, never, you don't know. There's a perfect. Uh, there's a perfect analogy I can make, but it's spoilers for a show I've been trying to get you to watch. So oh, shit. <laughs> I, I, can't, I can't make it. And I know that there's probably someone listening, like screaming it because it, it's a perfect matchup. This is just a horror version of it. Okay. Um. But yeah, I don't know if you want me to say okay. the name of the show or not. What's the name of the show? Good Place. Uh, You can tell me. I'll probably forget the time I watch it. Uh, <laughs> basically, um... The people that are in the bad place can be reset any number of times and have their memories manipulated or removed. Okay. And they, they do that again and again and again and again, like some like 800 some times with a particular group of people. Oh, okay. Okay. I got so, it. Yeah. Uh, changing the simulation uh, each time to try to make it better, quote unquote. Um, you know, to be yeah, more effective. I need to effective. watch Good Place. I just haven't got around to it. Yeah. No, you, you need to watch Good Place. Um, I, I, I can spoil something that would get you to watch it instantly because that's what got me. There was a particular spoiler no, 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 that I, got I, don't me tell to watch me, it. I do plan to watch it, so don't tell me. Yeah, but I had zero interest until I heard one spoiler, and then I was in. Okay. So. Yeah, I, I, I do plan to watch it. I just haven't got around to it yet, so don't tell me. I want to. I want to see it. <laughs> so uh, it's Mitch all and on Jack Netflix. After- watch it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Mitch and Jack, uh, after they have the the sequence where they run over the, the creature, they are back on the highway and it essentially loops back around to the beginning of the movie. They are right back where they started as they are in the lead up to the cafe. 
And the movie essentially ends with him having the same conversation again with the cashier. Uh, you know, like rough night. He's like, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. That be um, it. So yeah, that's a that's a movie we, we just uh spent two and a half hours talking about again that we told him. <laughs> we specifically said after Alien and the Thing, this won't happen again. <laughs> right. And it happened again. It happened again. And it happened again. But so, yeah. so I'm so glad that it seems like you like the movie for the most part because uh, I obviously love this movie. I think it's great. I think it's great. the The only weak link in it, I think, is Jailbreak. Um, I think the accident is the strongest one, ironically, because typically, like the accident, just seems like you know, just down to earth, like real, you would think that way out and way in would be my favorites. Cause they're supernatural, the most supernatural probably. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I, I really enjoyed this movie. I'm really glad sh- that you, uh, brought it up. It's a shame that like 12 people have seen this movie cause it's so good. And it's like, if, if it's something that like I hadn't even heard of, th- th- hardly anyone's heard of it because I'm, usually pretty in the know on on horror movies especially and for those who have just gone completely under my radar i hope that people are able to seek it out and check it out and watch it before they watch this in-depth analysis spoiling every (laughs) single detail in the movie because like we've talked about there is a there's it's great thematically and i love the attention to detail in the set design like we talked about all the easter eggs it's just there's so much, uh, so much good stuff. Uh, just a couple, uh, really quickly, a couple Easter eggs we didn't specifically talk about. Uh, the shaking in the cafe in the way in uh, is implied to be the same that you hear in the way, uh, you know, out when they're, uh, you know, having the the shit attack them from underneath the ground with the tentacles and everything. You know, oh, it's happening simultaneously. Yeah, it's like everything is happening simultaneously within the purgatory. It's kind of interesting Ooh. to think about. That's timey wimey. Um, I like Tommy Wyman. Yeah, I, I like Wibby Wobby as well. <laughs> uh, I bet they, you do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the DJ's voiceover in the beginning and o- in opening segments, the way out and the way in, uh, is slightly different, implying that the loop is able to be changed, um, uh, and the characters are able to make different choices to potentially escape if they stop making the the, the you know the, the same wrong decisions time and time again. Yeah, that was one thing that I was going to... I closed it. I'm trying to reopen it. Uh, I forgot that I wanted to include in this because I like it. Um, da, 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 da. Oh, yeah. The the closing credits radio dialogue from the DJ. Uh-huh. Regret and remorse. Amends and atonement. Well, that's life, right? The next one... Um, the next one is for you. For all you lost souls racing on that long road to redemption. All you sinners running from your past. But... Heading straight into that pit of darkness up ahead. We're all on the same endless highway. The one with no name, no exits. Looking for a way out of tonight and into tomorrow. Well, they're going to try to stop you, but you got to say, fuck it and keep moving. Because this is your highway. And today might be the day you finally outrun those wicked demons once and for all. And I'll be right here with you, making sure that you get where you're going. Because in the end, we're all just trying to find our way home, right? Fuck, this movie's so good. I know. Uh, it's because it's because it's all just telling you the fucking movie, but it works because it's written really well. And at the same time, it sounds like because of the performance, something you'd hear a fucking radio DJ say. Yeah. 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 It's just this, this, much darker. <laughs> mm-hmm. This was a cool uh tidbit that I didn't catch that I found on research of the film. The knocks that lure Mitch into the motel uh in the way out are the same pattern as the knocks from outside the house and the way in. So good. Yeah. So it's like fucking next level. Like no one's seen it. It makes me so sad. I'm so glad that you watched it and liked it. I figured you would because uh, what, one of the the stories that I, that I have written is, is very similar to this. And you're always like, hey, Jeff, when are you going to write more of that thing? And I was like, here's more of that thing and a lot better. <laughs> yeah. I specifically told you that this is the movie version of the stories that you tend to write and send me. Yeah. And they just beat like, you to it. Because, like, man, when you, just th- you think about it, uh, Dark Souls ambiguity, Bloodborne creatures, 
uh, you know, you have uh, purgatory, you have attention to detail in the set design, and it's just like this is like this is like Ron and Jeff crack to a T. I yeah, it, it, I had never heard of it, didn't know a thing about it, went into it blind, and um, yeah, yeah, this is right up my alley. Uh, not big. It's funny, all we've covered so far is horror, and my next one's not far off. <laughs> but it I'm not a big horror guy. Uh I like horror, but a lot of horror is just either I'm not mm, I'm gonna say this. I'm not a big supernatural horror guy. Supernatural really gets to me and really kind of bothers me in a real like kind of fundamental way. Mm-hmm. And that's why the siren was kind of hard for me to watch. Um, actually. But it um this is the right amount of supernatural for me when you start getting into like the exorcist and stuff like i start getting like weird vibes and it's kind of hard for me to look at the screen oh okay um but yeah this is when we started getting into the siren i was like no 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 <laughs> <laughs> and it wasn't even like scary movie type of creep out it's just like yeah i don't know the the religious ones kind of get to me um okay but yeah, no, uh this is my kind of this is my kind of horror. Horror with a purpose. I like horror with a purpose. Yeah, this is this has probably made its way into my kind of uh I have like there's I often spend Halloween uh and in the month of October trying to like catch up on new stuff I haven't seen, like with Southbound this year that has one I hadn't seen and wanted to check out once I discovered it. Uh but I also have like a little like round table of you know stuff you revisit that's kind of like your catalog of favorites. This is probably something I'll revisit every few years now, just because I really, really like this movie. But uh, yeah, uh, Ron, would you like to talk about what our next film is going to be? Our next film was made in the same year as Southbound, actually, and it is available on Netflix. And it is called, and this is very important, it is called Circle. If you are watching Emma Watson and Tom Hanks, then you are watching The Circle, and that is the wrong movie. <laughs> <laughs> this movie is simply called Circle. Circle, okay. Uh Uh-huh. And it is 50 strangers that are forced to stand in one place in a circle, deciding who's the next person to die. Oh, okay. I'm down. I'm down. Yep. And it is uh, is a pretty interesting character study. And even though it's a character study, all 50 of these people are total strangers that you know nothing about. It is a, a unique look into kind of just humanity and the way people tend to think and a lot of stereotypes and stuff kind of come out and in the best way i mean that in the best way because it's kind of exploring all of that okay so yeah, this is when i so this is continuing like with southbound uh this is not a movie i have seen so this would be me being introduced to it. i think i brought so. it up to you when i first watched it about a year or two ago yeah, I vaguely remember us talking about it, but it, I, it was when I did not get around to seeing. This is one that, since you tend to come at stuff from a writer's point of view, I am very interested in hearing what you have to say about Circle. It's it sounds very interesting and up my alley and like a uh, because I'm a fucking geek for just like shit that seems to be unexplained and it's like a subtextual like examination on shit. Mm-hmm. That's that's stuff I I didn't like, so I, I'm pretty excited to watch it. It's uh the directors. Are also the writers. It's Aaron Hahn and Mario. I'm uh, Miss Miss Coin, Gascoin, Father Gascoin, <laughs> Gascoin, uh, Bloodborne. Uh, <laughs> they're known for the Vault and Circle, and that is about it. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. So, okay. yeah, the another you said it was on Netflix. Yeah, it's on Netflix, okay. and I love me a good director team, and I like it when the director is also the writer, and this is both. So okay, all right. Yep. So this has become a, uh, a horror podcast. <laughs> <laughs> this is basically a horror podcast. This one is more like a less horror, probably more suspense. It's okay. not. It's uh, not gory and like it's a terrible situation, but it's not like super terrible things that happen. It's it's like if Kevin Smith wrote a horror movie. It's like fifty people standing in a circle talking. Um, okay. So, and, but yeah, it is I'm, it's very interesting i am intrigued i am ready to uh check this out and again it is circle <laughs> circle not don't, not don't, the don't tom do hanks the and the watson film <laughs> <laughs> don't do the other one 
Yeah, that is the first thing that came to my mind when you said circle. I was like, wait, the, the Emma Watson movie? Because <laughs> I didn't see that one. <laughs> yeah, that one is the circle. So yeah, don't do don't okay. don't do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, uh, the, if you would like to check out more of our podcasts, as we referenced a few times, we have past episodes on Alien and the Thing, and, and uh, Dark this Souls is going and to- Bloodborne. <laughs> Yeah, and we might we might as well. Uh, what's gonna happen as soon as we stop this recording is we're gonna bullshit about some type of Dark Souls game or Bloodborne or something for like an hour to the point where we literally could do a subsect podcast of video games if we wanted to, but we just have not at this time. So yeah, uh, you can check us out for updates on the show on Twitter at SPR Filmcast and on Anchor. Just uh, search uh, Anchor and Screenplay Rewind. You should be able to find it there. Yep, we are on at this point ten platforms now, Jeff. Um, the the last that many. I checked, I don't think we have any ratings or reviews yet. But that is the uh, easiest way to help us out, and the most impactful way to help us out is to recommend us to a friend or someone you think would, you know, uh, enjoy our content. Um, yes, it would be greatly appreciated. Also, if you would like to actually uh, talk to us. Uh, and uh, email in to screenplayrewind at gmail.com. Uh, we would love to have your thoughts on the, you know, both our episode and the movie itself that we talk about. If you'd like to have your, uh, we will opinions. email you back and forth all day long about Dark Souls. Oh, that, yeah. That's basically <laughs> like, half the day is just me and Ron texting each other something about Souls. Hey, if you have a different take on any of the stories in Southbound than what we came up with, I would be very yeah. interested in reading those. Yeah, this is this is a movie I would love to just like send out to just like ten random people. Yeah, and just because you know you would like we were talking about uh, earlier, you could have you know ten different interpretations because it's so much up to uh, up to you know like what your thoughts on the characters' motivations, you know, like your reaction to certain things. Like I love stuff like that where there is no right or wrong answer; it's just whatever you know you draw from the material. I think it, I think it makes the material stronger. Yes, absolutely. Okay, uh, so thank you for listening to this. What's probably going to end up being another two-part episode that we didn't <laughs> Because we're, yeah. Apparently, that's just going to be a thing from now on. Eventually, Ron, we have to find a fucking movie that we don't talk about for three goddamn hours, right? <laughs> Eventually, like, the thing has been the short episode at this so point. far. Like, what, the, what the fuck is that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a thing, Jeff. It's a thing. It's a thing. It is, it is a thing. So, yeah, thanks for checking this out, and we will see you next time for Circle. That's my southbound. It's watching goddamn House Shark. <laughs> <laughs> you get right to the end of House Shark, and it just starts back at the fucking beginning. <laughs> it doesn't even go to credits. It just fades out and back in. I can't think of a worse hell. (laughs) (laughs) I will talk to you later, Peter.